Thanks a million. Jo Joanna Moran, thank you so much. Congratulations uh, to, jo to Joanna and David and everybody who participated in, in helping organize this. Uh, thank you guys so much. To the developers out there who are thinking, hey, that could be me. I'm developing on Algorand, or I've got an idea, and I want to do this. I want you to know that you can come to the Algorand.Foundation website, click on Developers. In there, we talk all about the greenhouse hack, and we, uh, we, 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 we talk all about this series. You can get connected with um, not only the learning materials, but also the accelerator programs and so on. Come and join us. All right, next up, uh, I'm really excited to welcome to the stage uh, one of my colleagues at Algorand Inc., the head of cryptography, Chris Pikert. Now, he is going to be talking to us about uh, the third pillar that Paul Regal uh, started the day off talking about, right? So uh, Chris is going to be talking to us about interoperability, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, the cryptography part of, the, of what that looks like for state proofs. Uh, we've got um, the title slide going to come up and tell us all about it. Right, we're going to get there. There you are. All right, right. Um, so with that, Chris, welcome to the Algorand Tech Talk stage. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ryan, for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So I'm uh, Chris Pikert. I'm the head of cryptography research at uh, Algorand Inc. And uh, I'm glad to be telling you today uh, about how we are um, looking at the enduring value of uh, Algorand uh, via two intertwined uh, techniques, uh, state proofs and post-quantum cryptography. So when we think about Algorand's long-term value, uh, there are a lot of interesting questions, a lot of important problems to solve. Uh, but two of the things that we've really been focusing on, and Paul talked about this uh, in the morning and we've been thinking about for a long time, uh, are two key goals. One of which is interoperability and exchange between the Algorand network and others out in the world. And the second is what's called security against uh, future quantum computers, should they emerge, uh, also known as post-quantum security. And both of these are really integral for the long-term uh, value and integrity of uh, Algorand network and blockchain. And in this talk, I'll tell you about one new tool that we have created that addresses both of these goals uh, at once. And it's known as Algorand state proofs. So let me talk a little bit more about these two goals and, and give the motivation uh, for what we're, where we're going today. First, interoperability. So Algorand nodes uh, running the layer one protocol, this great Algorand protocol, are very quickly and frequently and very cheaply reaching consensus on what's happening in the network. So what are the accounts? What are the balances? What are the transactions that are happening? What are the results of smart contracts? What, everything that's going on every few seconds, the, Al the Algorand uh, protocol, uh, pure proof of stake, allows the whole network to agree and move forward uh, and what's happening on the network. So that's really great. And for everybody you know, who's running the, the layer one protocol, or running an Algorand node, you know, they, no secret uh, to any of these benefits. But what about the rest of the world, uh, the ones who aren't enlightened enough to be you know, running Algorand nodes or maybe can't because of certain constraints? Uh, what about talking to other projects outside the Algorand network? So let me give you a few examples of uh, those which we might want to interoperate with. So one is just new nodes, new nodes on uh, the Algorand network. At present, uh, if you want to start up a new node, um, you may need to verify the entire chain, the entire history of the chain, starting from the Genesis block. And this is not terribly uh, expensive, but it may take a little while. You just have to run up and retrieve the entire uh, history of the blockchain and verify it uh, you know, over maybe a few hours or a day or so. So we'd like to do better than that and allow new nodes to come online more quickly. Uh, another example would be light clients. So uh, nodes which maybe are coming offline and then back online or are, uh, don't have a lot of computational power, don't have a lot of bandwidth. Um, they can't track every update that's happening to the chain, but they may be able to show up here and there and uh, get updates of what's been happening. So they can't afford to run the full uh, Algorand uh, protocol for whatever reason. 
And then a third, even more extreme example would be uh, other blockchains, like, for example, Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum, you know, you can run smart contracts on Ethereum, but those contracts are too expensive to run a full Algorand node on. So you can't, you know, there's just way too much uh, computational cost, gas costs way too much to run a full Algorand node on Ethereum. That's just not going to fly uh, at all. So in terms of uh, constraints, these, these are smart contracts are very highly constrained uh, on other blockchains. So these are the kinds of examples of things we'd like to be able to operate with, uh, even though they're not able to run the full Algorand uh, uh, protocol. And that's one of the goals uh, of the topic for today, to allow these to securely interact and transact with, with Algorand nodes. Uh, the second goal, as I mentioned, is uh, something called post-quantum security. And the story here begins in 1994, uh, when Peter Shore, this mathematician, uh, published this paper entitled polynomial time algorithms for prime factorization and discrete logarithms on a quantum computer. OK, so that's a big mouthful. Uh, what does that mean? Well, in short, it means that a large-scale quantum computer, if it were ever built, would be able to totally break all of the widely used public key cryptography uh, that we use today and have used for decades. All right, now, that means all the cryptography, all the signature schemes that are used on blockchains, all of the VRFs, all of the uh, zero-knowledge proofs, made basically all of those, uh, on and on and on. Basically, all of the, the cryptographic primitives that the security of all blockchains rely on would be up in smoke. Now, that requires a quantum computer, a large-scale quantum computer, uh, which are still some, some distance off. People are putting in a lot of work to build such quantum computers for various reasons, not just breaking cryptography. Um, and there's a ways to go. But when we think about the future, 15, 20 years out, there's a substantial, you know, significant chance that such a com quantum computer would be developed in that kind of time frame. And so it's the kind of thing that we have to be thinking about now when we think about the long-term uh, security and integrity of our cryptography. So in recognition of this, uh, the United States uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology began a post-quantum cryptography standardization process in 2016, uh, which has largely been completed, but not, not entirely. There's still work happening there. Uh, and many other uh, agencies and organizations around the world have uh, recognized the, the importance of this topic and are working toward standardizing post-quantum cryptography and, and deploying it. And there have been many uh, experiments, you know, real world, large-scale networks, Google, Cloudflare, and so forth, have all been working uh, on this topic uh, in practice as well. The research on it goes back decades. So to be a little more concrete, what would it mean, the emergence of a quantum computer, a large-scale quantum computer, what would that mean for blockchains and the security or, or lack thereof of blockchains? So a quantum computer could potentially attack uh, future progress of the chain. So for example, the quantum computer could uh, compute your, public, uh, your private keys, anybody's private key, forge transactions, steal money out of your, your account, steal money out of your wallet. Uh, it could do something even more fundamental to break the actual consensus of the protocol itself, causing some kind of fork. Different people in different parts of the world see different progress of the chain. Uh, all of this would be, would be really bad news. Uh, but this is forward-looking. So you would have to have a quantum computer attacking the future development or future progress uh, of the blockchain. There's another more subtle and somewhat insidious uh, possibility as well, which is an attack on the history of the blockchain. So a quantum computer could potentially create an alternative past, basically, and rewrite history or fork history. So not just uh, starting from what's going on today and into the future, but even looking back five years, 10 years, however, you know, to the beginning of the chain even, and uh, creates an alternative past, which would then fool uh, potential joiners of, of the network, those who haven't already seen what has, has happened. And so this is, when you think about it, even somewhat more worrisome, or at least it's more subtle. Right? Steal, forging transactions, that's something we can kind of understand clearly. But the consequences of creating an alternative fork of history are, are uh, a little harder to grapple with. Uh, but I think George Orwell, in uh, his book 1984, put it very nicely, whoever controls the past controls the future. So if you can control the past history of the blockchain, you, you own it completely. Uh, and another work from the mid-1980s also demonstrated the risks of changing the past, right? 
so if you, if you know what this refers to, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, here, Marty has put his existence at risk by going into the past and interfering with uh, his own, cr the creation of himself, right? And so he's starting to, to dissolve. All right, so that's what post-quantum cryptography is about. And our goal is to protect today's chain, the chain that's developing and, and progressing today on Algorand Network, from the possibility of future quantum attacks against the chain's integrity. All right, so our tool for addressing both this uh, interoperability and this post-quantum cryptography, or post-quantum security goal, is called state proofs. And uh, just in a slide, here's the sort of high-level idea of what state proofs are and what they do. So a state proof would look something like this. It's a claim that, uh, for example, some large majority of the stake, more than 70%, says that uh, round 187's block header is XYZ. Right? And uh, this is a relatively small uh, proof. It's a, just a blob of data. And it can be provided to what's known as the state proof verifier. So the state proof verifier is just a piece of code that runs. And when you provide it uh, with a, a candidate state proof, it will look at it and perform some checks. And it will say, OK, yes, I believe this. This looks good to me. Or no, this is suspicious. I don't believe it, and I'm going to ignore it. Right. So if, if the state proof looks good, then the verifier can say, yep, now I believe uh, this summary of uh, round 187, or everything that's happened up to round 187. Right? So in, in, in a few words, a state proof is some kind of small or small-ish summary of the recent state of the Algorand network, and it is backed by or attested to by a sufficient percentage of the overall stake in the network. What makes it uh, important for our, for our goals is that it's cheaply verifiable outside of Algorand. So you don't need to be running uh, the Algorand protocol. You don't need to do, you know, keep any updates about what's been happening. You just need uh, some tiny amount of uh, trusted data to start with. And then from that point on, you have a route which, with which you can verify all uh, state proofs that will be generated. And uh, a state proof will not be convincing. No one will be able to create a state proof unless the claimed percentage of the total stake in the network actually attested to the message. Right? So there's a, we'll have strong cryptographic guarantees that say the only way to produce such a state proof is for actually you know, this large percentage of the uh, stake represented on the network to have participated in its creation. Uh, in addition, uh, state proofs provide post-quantum security, post-quantum integrity, and uh, something called snark-friendly verification, or what I like to call snarky verification. And we'll talk about what that means at the end, uh, but post-quantum security uh, as well. And so what this does is it protects the chain's history from future quantum attacks. All the uh, nodes running the Algorand uh, protocol or not running the, node, uh, not running the protocol, those off the, off the protocol who are checking state proofs now have a post-quantum security assurance that what they have seen up to that state proof uh, cannot have been manipulated by a, a future quantum computer. OK, so that's the main uh, properties of state proofs. And let's talk about a couple of the applications uh, that they have, although I think you, know, you may have even better ideas about how these can be used. So the first one is uh, as a bridge to other chains, as I mentioned before. So the idea here is that uh, on whatever other chain, let's take Ethereum, for example, uh, there will be a smart co contract running, uh, and it'll be running the state proof verifier and remembering whatever the latest uh, proven summary of the state, of uh, Algorand state is. And then that contract, because it has had uh, attested the, the summary of Algorand's latest uh, state, it can then verify Algorand transactions, balances, whatever uh, it's provided about, you know, a claim about this happened on the Algorand chain, it can verify that relative to that uh, verified state. So here's an example. We have the smart contracts here running on another chain. It receives the state proof saying that 70% you know, claims that a summary of these rounds, 100 through 199, is XYZ. And uh, here's an update of the trusted data that you need. And uh, then we may have a smart contract running uh, on the chain, which is acting as a bridge. So this smart contract would be um, provided a claim that, for example, in round 187, Alice paid some bridge account uh, 100 algos intended for Bob over on the other chain. 
and providing a proof of that claim relative to the uh, state uh, attested to in the previous, uh, uh, previous case here. And so the smart contract would verify this, verify that yes, indeed, that transaction did occur on the Algorand uh, network, on the Algorand chain in this round as claimed. And therefore, I will now, as, as the bridge, pay Bob some equivalent amount of uh, Ethereum, for example. As time goes on, more things happen on the Algorand network. More rounds are produced, more blocks are produced, and uh, another state proof is produced. That state proof can then be, again, presented to the smart contract who can update its view or update, uh, come up to date with what's happened in, let's say, the next 100 rounds. Right? So in rounds 200 through 299, we have a summary of what happened, a valid state proof, uh, that indeed that did happen, and, uh, and the updates that are required. And now at this point, you can then say, OK, here's something that happened in round 250 or 285, and so forth. So this would just be going on uh, on the other chain uh, periodically. All right, so that's the, the kind of bridging application. Uh, a second application has more to do with um, Algorand nodes themselves, or maybe light clients. Uh, light clients wishing to maybe halfway participate uh, in, um, in the Algorand protocol. Um, so we have a way to bring new or returning or lightweight nodes up to date on what's happened uh, in Algorand. So instead of verifying the entire chain from the start or from whatever your last known good block was and you've gone offline for a while and now you've gotten a bunch of new, uh, new blocks, let's instead skip ahead using a state proof. So you just need to verify one state proof for every, let's say, several hundred rounds and jumping, you know, skipping ahead, basically, instead of verifying every uh, new block that's come along. All right, so um, this can be done by a light client. And as a bonus, even if you're not a light client, by verifying state proofs, you get a post-quantum uh, security or post-quantum integrity guarantee about the blocks that, you've, uh, you know, that, that the state proof covers. So even if you're not lightweight, it's still useful to verify these state proofs because now you know that a quantum computer has not interfered with uh, the history that you've, uh, that, that you've been accumulating. Right, so those are two of the, two of the applications, but maybe, you know, maybe you'll think of more. I think there's a lot of uh, excitement and, and interest in, uh, in this. But uh, let's do a little bit of a deeper, deeper dive. I won't get too technical, but um, I'm a scuba diver, so I like to kind of go down to maybe 15 meters and hang out there, maybe dip down to, to 20, 25 at a, at a moment or two. But uh, let's, let's get a little bit deeper into things. And I'll talk about the, some of the cryptographic techniques that are used in state proofs and the design and implementation choices uh, that go into them. Oh. So in a little more detail, um, is this clicker working? All right. So state proofs adhere to Algorand's ethos of keeping things highly decentralized. We don't want to introduce uh, some small, uh, you know, small number of nodes that you have to trust or anything like that. So this is a highly distributed uh, idea, which you know, keeps in, 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 uh, in keeping with Algorand's idea of uh, pure proof of stake, providing the highly distributed uh, consensus mechanism. So, in particular, what this means is that a uh, supermajority of the total Algorand stake on the network must contribute in order to create a state proof. If a supermajority does not contribute, then it will be infeasible for any attacker, no matter how much uh, power they have and how much quantum computing power they have, will be infeasible for an attacker to create a valid state proof. So here's an example. Um, all the participants in the Algorand network are contributing to the creation of a state proof. And then an untrusted prover, in this case, it would be like a server uh, that Algorand runs as a, as a community service, but you don't need to trust this prover. This prover would just assemble uh, the contributions that all the uh, participants are making, and then assemble the state proof out of those contributions. And the state proof contains just a small random fraction of those contributions. So here's an example in the upper right. Uh, we have all these different participants in the network uh, running the Algorand uh, protocol. They all own you know, different amounts of stake, 100 algos, 200 algos, 50, 40, whatever they own. And when it's time to create a state proof, each of them uh, makes a contribution. And then uh, through some basically cryptographic techniques and magic, there's some random, verifiably random selection of these contributions, which would then go into the ultimate state proof created by the the uh, central prover, right? So 
And the contributions are selected proportionally to how much stake each uh, contribution represents. Right? So in this case, the contribution produced by the person with 300 algos is more likely to be selected. Uh, but also this one from the person with 100 algos is selected, and maybe even the one with 40 uh, algos is selected. And the others are not actually becoming part of the state proof. Right? So we'll talk about how that, how that gives, uh, still gives good cryptographic confidence uh, in this state proof in a, in a moment. OK. So once these contributions are created and the verifiably random selection occurs, then the untrusted prover is able to package all of these up and create a state proof. On the other side, the state proof has to be verified. So to verify, what do you need to do? Well, all you need to do is start with a, a very small uh, piece of trusted data called the participation commitment. So there's a commitment, we'll call it compart, uh, and it basically wraps up in a uh, summary all of the participants' uh, current stake, stake, stakes, and uh, verification keys, so signature verification keys. And this is just a small piece, uh, just a few dozen bytes of information. And from that uh, information, you can uh, then verify uh, the entire contents of a state proof. And then the state proof also comes with a certification of the next updated uh, commitment to the participation. So, you know, as blocks are uh, blocks are produced, as transactions occur, people's stakes change, right? Some people buy, some people sell, and so we need an updated view of how much stake uh, each party has. And so each state proof uh, attests to the updated uh, state of the uh, account balances and so forth. All right, so by verifying, you can then kind of keep, keep going one step ahead uh, and verify each state proof as it's produced. OK, so let's talk a little bit more. We're going to dive down maybe to 20, 25 meters uh, at this point and uh, talk about how state proofs are actually generated and verified. So at a very high level, uh, this is coming from a paper by uh, McCauley, Silvio McCauley and, and uh, others uh, at Algorand from two years ago. And uh, it's called Compact Certificates. And what we've done is uh, added some extra features to this and uh, instantiated with, with post-quantum signatures and a tool called Vector Commitments. So I'll just kind of briefly go through uh, these ideas. Each participant in the network is going to sign uh, the data. So it's going to sign the summary uh, state that it wishes uh, to help create a state proof for. And it's going to create that signature, and then the prover will collect all these signatures. So these signatures are sent over the network to the prover. And then once enough of the total stake has provided signatures in this way, uh, the prover then bundles these up and does something called a vector commitment to them. So basically compresses them down into a very tiny, uh, uh, tiny commitment, a very small piece of data that uh, sort of locks down its claim about all these uh, signatures. Um, so these commitments are produced. No, this one commitment, rather, is produced, which sort of encapsulates all of the signatures that were uh, sent to the prover. And then third, uh, by using uh, cryptographic hash functions, uh, the prover can, in a verifiable way, randomly select just some, a small fraction, of those signatures in proportion to the stake attached to each of these uh, signatures. So signatures coming from uh, high value or high stake accounts who are more likely to be selected than those coming from low uh, stake accounts. But every signature has some probability of being uh, randomly selected in a verifiable way. And so the prover just includes these in the state proof and also reveals the corresponding uh, stake and verification key uh, of the user who was selected or of the account that was selected. And so to verify, the verifier just sort of has to check all of these things. It has to check all the openings of these vector commitments, has to check all the signatures, and then finally has to verify that indeed the prover has revealed uh, and, and, and chosen the correct random uh, selection of uh, the, the participants. Um, and so that's done by the uh, cryptographic hash function, just uh, checking that the hash function uh, matches up with what's been revealed. All right, so that's, uh, that's the 25 meter uh, view of what happens. Let's pop up a little bit and talk about the post-quantum uh, security of this. So it's very important, because we want post-quantum security, it's very important that all the cryptography and state proofs be using post-quantum ingredients. If we used any ingredients which were breakable by quantum computers, then 
state proofs would not provide us any, uh, you know, any actual post-quantum security. So from top to bottom, all of the ingredients going into this have to be uh, post-quantum secure. So there are two main ingredients. One that I just mentioned is the vector commitment. Um, vector commitments can be uh, created and uh, verified using uh, Merkle trees. So this is a, a very standard technique. And what we've done is instantiated Merkle trees with uh, what's known as the subset sum uh, hash function. Uh, this this subset sum function goes back uh, several decades, been very heavily studied, um, and we have uh, we've used it specifically for its collision resistance properties, which is what's needed for Merkle trees. So if you're interested, uh, you can check out the specification and uh, our code implementation uh, on our GitHub here. Second ingredient is a digital signature scheme. So we need a post-quantum uh, digital signature scheme. And we chose, uh, for this purpose, uh, one of the submissions to the NIST uh, post-quantum cryptography uh, process called Falcon. And Falcon was ultimately uh, chosen by NIST for uh, ultimate standardization. So it was one of, uh, one of the winners of this process. Uh, we chose it much earlier. Um, and so NIST you know, did a good job uh, following us, I would say. Yeah. But uh, it's a lovely, lovely scheme, really nice uh, signature scheme. Uh, what we had to do was uh, modify it very slightly into what we call a deterministic uh, signing mode. Let me just say one word about what that means. Falcon signatures. Uh, every Falcon signature includes something called a public salt. And uh, by default, that public salt is chosen at random every time. Uh, so every time you sign a message, uh, a random salt is used and included in the signature. Um, but for our ultimate uh, snark friendliness, our needs for snark friendliness, we actually need all the users to use the same uh, public salt uh, across all signatures. And so in, uh, in that case, what we need is to make the signing process deterministic. There's a, a deterministic choice of salt uh, that does not vary across different signatures or different, different signing processes. And uh, then once that salt is chosen, the, um, the actual signing process producing the signature is also uh, deterministic. So fortunately, this deterministic mode was very uh, easily and naturally achieved with a simple wrapper around Falcon's uh, existing API. Uh, so the implementation uh, that the Falcon team gave was, was really lovely for this purpose. And uh, you can see all the details with uh, the spec and code again at our GitHub. And uh, you can also see a blog post that uh, John Woods at the foundation wrote about our choice of, of Falcon and, and what uh, some of the history there. And in short, it was. Uh, the foundation of Falcon was created by uh, many Algorand affiliates, myself included, way back in 2008. And, uh, and then uh, many ad additional ideas went into the, the Falcon um, uh, submission. But uh, it's a lovely, lovely scheme, and, and uh, NIST thought so as well. All right, let me conclude with uh, some kind of what's next, what we're doing uh, new and, and, and even cooler uh, with state proofs. So state proofs are snarky. And what this means is that we can ultra compress them, make state proofs really small. So here's the picture that I've shown you before, where here's a state proof, here's a state proof verifier. What we're going to do is compress that picture down even further with uh, what's called a snark proof and a snark verifier. So the motivation here is that state proofs themselves are moderately small. Uh, certainly small enough to do a lot of interesting things with. But unfortunately, they're still too big to provide uh, to Ethereum smart contracts on a routine basis. Uh, smart contracts are just you know, too much gas to provide lots of data to an Ethereum smart contract. And so we need, to, we need to squeeze down further and make things even smaller. So the big idea, or maybe the small idea, is to replace the state proof with something even tinier and cheaper to verify uh, called a snark a snark proof. And in particular, what we're going to prove is that we know a valid state proof. All right, so this gets a little bit meta. We start with a real state proof, and then we convert it into a snark proof. The snark proof proves that we knew a valid state proof. Okay, so it's kind of, this is cryptographic magic, but it's really, uh, really cool stuff. And uh, it's a very tiny proof. So the snark proof is very tiny, but it stands in for and is a convincing proof that we knew a valid state proof. All right? And so what that allows us to do is uh, to cheaply verify snark proofs on uh, other chains like Ethereum using a snark verifier uh, in an Ethereum smart contract. 
All right, so one of the big pieces in the design of state proofs allowing this to occur is our choice of our post-quantum primitives. So not only are the post-quantum primitives giving us post-quantum security, they're also very snark friendly. Uh, both the deterministic falcon and some hash verifying these functions uh, is mostly linear and, and hence quite snark friendly. And so we're able to actually convert uh, snark proofs into, I'm sorry, state proofs into snark proofs in a uh, relatively feasible way. Um, Algorand will do it as a, as a service to the community, but you don't have to trust it, right? So we do the work of all the heavy lifting of converting the state proof to the snark proof, but the cryptography assures you that we have done it in a, in a trustworthy way. All right, so uh, just to wrap up with some parting thoughts. Again, state proofs are allowing for easy verification of Algorand state by entities that are outside the Algorand network, that aren't running the, the layer one protocol, uh, of which there are many. And there's lots of applications of this. I gave you two of them, the, the bridging to other chains and fast catch up. Uh, but you know, we'd love for you to think of more, more uses of these uh, state proofs. Um, secondly, state proofs are giving the Algorand chain uh, long-term post-quantum security. Even if a uh, cryptographically relevant quantum computer were to emerge in the coming years, uh, the history of the Algorand chain would be protected from such, uh, from such computers. And lastly, these state proofs can be ultra compressed down into uh, very tiny and cheap to verify snark proofs, which can be verified on highly constrained uh, environments like smart contracts on Ethereum or other ultra lightweight clients uh, or the like. Right? Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. And I'd love to take your questions. Thanks for your attention. All right, thank you, Chris. Yes, uh, I think we do have a question over here. Okay, thank you, Chris. I have several questions, but I won't hog the mic. So I'll just start with, uh, at the beginning, you talked about quantum computers changing the history of the blockchain. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how that's possible, given that you know all the participating nodes know the current state? How, sure. can, how can that change? Yeah, that's, that's a, so as I was saying, this is a bit of a subtle topic. If you're running an Algorand uh, node and participating on the network as the chain is evolving, you know, maybe from the early days, and you've seen everything happen, then yes, you can have confidence. As long as, as, long as you think there hasn't been a quantum computer messing with things up to this point, yes, you can have confidence that because I saw everything happen you know, prior to quantum computers emerging, then I feel good about the, the current status. The problem is for people who are maybe entering the network for the first time and are provided with, okay, here's what's been going on in the three, four years that you were you know, not on the network, right? And a quantum computer could potentially fork the history and present some alternate history to the, the newcomers, right? And not just newcomers, but smart contracts, all the ones who are outside the network who haven't been participating from the beginning or you know, from before the time of, of quantum computers. So that's the, that's the risk. And of course, with the interoperability story, there are many you know, participants who we want to uh, st you know, show what's been happening on Algorand in a, in a quantum secure way. Okay. I'll ask one more and then yeah. I'll give it up. Um, when we talk about post-quantum security, is, is there some specific property about quantum computers that makes them special, or is it just a question of compute power? Yes, so there are very special properties uh, that are very hard to describe in, in five seconds, um, unless you're a quantum computing expert, I suppose, but then you already know the answer to the question. Uh, but for some reason, the, uh, the ability to have cancellations and do Fourier transforms and so forth over complex probabilities is the kind of uh, magic power that quantum computers have. And it just so happens to be perfectly suited to breaking all the cryptography that we've deployed in the past 40 years. It's, it's kind of a bummer. But uh, at the same time, it's given us all these you know, motivation to do all these new uh, great uh, cryptography schemes that have other awesome properties. And there we have it. Mr. Chris Pikert, our head of cryptography. I want to say thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. We, he is just a wealth of information, and, yeah. and he takes questions. And I want, and I want to 
uh, in the interest of time, I'm yeah. going to say thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I'm available. Find me offline. And we're, and we're going to get the next group up here. But I want to make sure that you guys follow him on Twitter. He, um, he, he, he will answer your questions. I know this because when I'm in the office and he comes uh, in, into the office as well, we will sit next to uh, each other. And, and he will spend the time with me to explain this stuff you know, very succinctly, just like he's done here today. A great wealth of information. Give it up for Chris Pikert. Okay.